This is the Athletic Football Show. Welcome to the Athletic Football Show. I'm Robert Mays. Joining me today, it's my good friend Nate Tice. Nate, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. I uh, I know the setup. This is the Traveling Robert Roadshow uh, for the free agency stuff. I, I having to do my first podcast in this past calendar year of like setting up the office configuration, or I'm sorry, the hotel room configuration to get everything set up. I can empathize with you now. Now I understand what a pro you are. That always getting this done. Did you bring lighting too? Uh, but I have my lights. I'm going to tweet out a picture of my setup. It, really? I, I brought the whole thing with me. It's It looks insane. Like ha- the, awesome. What I had to do to get this thing ready to go, it looks absolutely insane. But guess what? We're dedicated to this. You this did is it. important. You did it. Are you hardwired too? Like we, you're no, really- God. Oh, okay. No, I'm not Dang, hardwired. Yeah. But Love we it. did plenty of Ethernet checking. I don't, I don't know how you get hardwired in a hotel in 2023. I think that, that comes with like a special setup here you're not you're not at that marriott bonus level yet the, no, no. The, that status i do not have the, the titanium ethernet level <laughs> all right we got plenty to get to today day three of free agency uh, i mean it started off with a bang obviously with the roger stuff happening on mcafee a little bit earlier today plenty of stuff to get into but let's start with that so okay. what would you think of that what would what, 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 you think of this entire orchestration by him on that side of things i love learning about the uh the history lesson of the 2005 packers front office i think that was my favorite part listening all the future gms they had in that front office did you know that front offices change in 15 years it's there's not going to be the same people there that (laughs) that, i think that was that was probably the part uh also like the darkness should be capitalized now like you know like the band oh my god like, I, I just absolutely love that everyone has been saying that like you know when he emerged from the darkness, the darkness. i know he just listened to the rhythm of his heart there's a chance he can make it now <laughs> <laughs> i was I, i've been sitting on that the, the, fact, the fact that you can pull those lyrics from that song which are unintelligible in the course of the normal song is pretty impressive i'm gonna be honest yeah, you gotta hit the high note on that one too but it, it was one of those where there's two sides to every story and it's one of those it's not it's always gonna seem like it, or it always seemed like it was gonna be kind of a I would say messy, but convoluted situation, you know, with this type of player, not just like just because of Aaron Rodgers, but just where he's at in his career. It could have been any player and that he wants to keep playing. They want to move on and all that. So it's just it's just funny. <laughs> That's really it. It's just a fun uh, side note of this offseason. I feel like that we'll look at back, look back on and go. Remember that? Remember that kind of two months and that experience and then the McAfee show and his announcement, I guess, is a good way to put it. Even though he said it's, it's been a week and it depended on what day he went in and to, into the darkness. Friday. He knew on Friday, Friday that he okay. intended to play for the Jets is okay. the way that he phrased it. So okay. what what he said, you know, we'll see how much of this is true. Who the heck knows uh, the way that he framed it? is that when he went into the darkness, capital T, T, capital D, he was 90% sure that he was going to retire. Okay. And then when he emerged afterward, the tone had changed with the Packers, is yeah. how he was framing it. They had pushed a little too hard, potentially, to get him out of town where it had previously seemed like they were intent on letting him have all the time that he needed to make his decision. And because of that, now he feels motivated, I guess, to continue to play because the Packers don't want him. So reading into what he said today, it kind of feels like a revenge play. I don't know. That's kind of what it seems like. He set up his own revenge tour. I yes. mean, that's that's really what it was. And oh, my I, God. I, just 20 wicks the entire season. Right. Every week. We just wait. That should just be the recurring one. That's always five wicks. Doesn't matter who he's playing against. Um, it seemed like the Packers told him to take his time and then once it hit about two months and they hadn't heard word at all from Rogers, I think they're like, okay, we got to do good. something. Like, We're all we, set. We, yep. Yeah. And we got to figure this out. Like no word is what they, I guess they needed. Um, yeah. If we believe, believe Rogers, story, you know, there's always going to be, be, you know, like I said, there's always two sides of every story. The Packers are going to get nothing for him because he was going to retire. And so they basically gave him the cold shoulder and they got, now they got draft compensation from the Jets incoming. So I guess a win-win <laughs> with nobody saying a word to each other, but yeah, it's a, it's an interesting situation. 
So right now, Roger says that the finance, the the Packers are holding up the negotiations. I guess is kind of how he was framing yeah. it. That they're trying to play hardball a little bit. I think digging their heels in is the framing that he used. The finances of it are a little bit complicated. He has an option bonus that can be exercised anytime between now and the start of the regular right. season. So there's really no urgency on the Packers end to get this done. And if they want to get more for him, you know whatever is holding it up on their end, whatever is motivating them. They don't really have a predefined sense of urgency based on that timeline. My understanding based on some of the financial information available and also something that Jason Fitzgerald wrote on over the cap, who's very good at kind of sorting through these complicated trade fallout things with these guys is that if they trade him after June 1st, they would save about $25 million in dead money on their cap this year. It would go from 40 million if they traded him before June 1st to 20 to 15, if they traded him after June 1st, I don't know if that's a motivating factor in any way, but I yeah. believe that is the case. That makes sense. And I mean, God, it's just so crazy to see an option bonus for $58.3 million. I mean, the that's Packers a, knew what they were doing. Oh yeah. No, this was their kind of, I would say I'm not get out of jail free card. This was their, you know, break glass, the case of emergency. They had this out always kind of built in. Um, that kind of seems the timeline. And like you said, there's now no urgencies because that's kicks in. And it's until, like you said, until week one, right? Yeah. I remember Start of the regular that. season. Start yep. of the regular season. Yeah. So that's exactly it. There's not like that. Have to do this right now. Have to figure it out. They have plenty of time to work the compensation. When the Jets Twitter account is tweeting it, like tweeting about like the Aaron Rodgers thing, it's kind of like the Packers are like, I love this leverage. Like, yeah. like great. Think, because he, now they have no, it's, it's, well, we, how we framed it before. They really have no other choice and they really no haven't had another choice for yeah. a while here. They made this bed. Yeah. They made, they made this Aaron Rodgers bed. Hey, they try to do this with Favre. Let's bring another Packers quarterback in, which is round two of this. So that's, I wanted to get into that side of it where yeah. at the end of the Favre saga, whatever, how are you? Yeah, whatever you want to call it. Saga, you know, it, whatever, how, whatever word you Experience. want to Experience. Yes. I mean, just like the kerfuffle. I mean, it, the entire thing was just so weird. I, I was young. You know, I don't – it was 2007, 2008. I was yeah. still in college. I wasn't yeah. watching it with the same eye that I would now. But I remember just kind of petering out in a way that felt a little bit sad. You know, by the end, even Packers fans, friends that I had when we were young and a little bit more irrational were just like, I'm done. Like, I just want it to be right. over with. I don't I don't want to be dealing with this anymore. And that's kind of how it feels this time around with Rodgers. And that's kind of a bummer. Yeah. You know, him trying to tap into this, you know, I might be the greatest player in franchise history and they wanted me to retire a Packer. And it's hard to have your cake and eat it, too. You know, yeah. you tried to play this game every single offseason. If you wanted to ride off into the sunset, a legend and not have any bad blood between you and the organization, you have plenty of chances and plenty of opportunities to do that. Right. But by playing it out this way so many times over and over again, they got tired of it. They got fatigued of the entire charade and they wanted to move on. And now the marriage is uglier. It's messier. Yeah. And there really isn't a clean way to when this is all said and done, look back on it and be like, man, what a marvelous career Aaron Rodgers had for the Packers. And Part of me wants to do that because right. it was a marvelous career. He's one of the greatest players in NFL history. Yep. And so we should he should his time there should be remembered as such. But with all of this like nonsense mm -hmm. that surrounds it now, there isn't really an inclination to talk about it or think about it that way because it's underneath so many layers of gunk. Yeah. Even even, you know, he won two back to back MVPs recently, and even just always just felt like something was hanging over it. Like yeah. it just never felt like celebratory, maybe because how the seasons ended in both of those years. Yeah, maybe. Maybe that was it. And it just, yeah, it just seems like there's been a funk over the team a little bit because of this. It's self-made, you know, it's the situation when you have a great player that's stubborn and then you got a franchise that when I say stuck in their ways, I don't mean in a negative sense. They they will stick to what they believe in as a franchise, the Packers. I mean, just look at yeah, they, they drafted draft. Jordan Love in the first round. That's what they do. <laughs> yeah. Like they they beat to their own drum. And I, I mean that in a good way. Like the Packers just will, they are stubborn in their sense. They're a unique franchise and how they can operate. And they, it's worked for them. I mean, having back to back historical quarterbacks really helps, but, uh, but it's worked for them really in the long term. Um, uh, everyone could say what they say. Oh, only one Super Bowl. But yeah, I'll take 10 wins every single year, guaranteed. Like that it was that's an a, unbelievable that's stretch. That's a fun of way dominant. to live. Yeah, an uh, unbelievable stretch of success. Some of the best historical seasons in quarterback history before, like, I mean, just 
incredible seasons. The the 2000, what was it, 2011 season is probably one of the best quarterback seasons ever. An unbelievable I, year. And then yep. 2014, they were just on an absolute terror that entire season. I mean, those yeah. two, those first two MVPs, just insane years. And obviously the yep. run that he had on the way to the Super Bowl. For you guys that are a little bit younger, you know, maybe that are like in your 20s and you don't remember what early career Rodgers looked like, go back and watch the highlights of the Super Bowl that they won against the Steelers. It's insane. Like his season to that point, you know, he wasn't, that guy, he eventually was in 2011 or was in 2014 through the entire Super Bowl winning season. But by the time they got to the playoffs, you got a glimpse of what prime Aaron Rodgers was going to look like. Yeah, He makes four or five throws in that game against Pittsburgh that are the four or five of the best throws any other quarterback would make in their entire lifespan. You could see him come alive in that 2010 playoffs. Like yeah. the the Falcons game, I believe it was in the, uh, in the divisional round was the one that stuck out to me and Falcons personnel people were still burned from that game. That game was burned into their brain because they said a corner got hurt. I can't, I'm, I don't want to mix up the names, but one of their starting corners got hurt and one of their backups trotted in off the sideline. And they say, and I, this pro scout of the Falcons would tell the story. And it's one of the funniest stories, but he said you could, they were up in the press box and you could see Rogers poke his head out of the huddle and see the other guy walking into the game. And they say that he targeted that guy like the next five snaps, just threw <laughs> balls at him. But they said that's when they realized, I was like, this guy, because like, Aaron Rodgers wasn't Aaron Rodgers in 2010. Well, he, wa- they, he wasn't yet. He wasn't that, yet. The playoff run kind of like uh, got, put him up a tier. And then the next season, it was like, holy shit, this guy's amazing. And that's, they said when they watched him in that moment and what, how, what a killer he was, they were, they were said, oh my God, this guy's incredible. We didn't realize that, that he had this in him. But that story is always burning my brain, like him poking his head out seeing the backup corner walking in and going, oh, yeah, I'm targeting that guy the next couple snaps. But like you said, I, I just wish it, I, I, I think I'm a sucker for the clean narrative. I, I mean, I'm a sports fan. I love the guys that are the one one club teams, as they yeah. call them in soccer and just or any sport. I like that. I'm a sucker for that. But it's too, it's a stubborn individual and a stubborn organization. And the organization kind of like they kind of are going to end up getting their own way. But it's, it seems like Rodgers is now building the narrative of, yeah, I'm going to take this out on the league next year, which is I think is interesting and fun. I mean, I, I'm all for that. Again, as a neutral fan, I'm all for that kind of narrative stuff. I used to have such an appreciation. I mean, I still have such an appreciation for him, and I, I still do, but I think a lot of it was born in getting the shit kicked out of him twice right. a year, out of us twice a year, every Annoying. single year for my entire life. Yeah. And I, I felt a similar way about Brett Favre because of that. Like when you watch those guys up close so often yeah. and your team – plays little brother for decades at a time because of what they can do. It's impossible not to develop a real appreciation. Like you sit in awe of what that kind of quarterback play looks like consistently when you've lived a life on the furthest opposite end of the spectrum. And so I was always that guy that, you know, tweet dragon memes and talking about him that way. And just like, I, I was always, again, just stood in awe of how good he was. I wrote about him a ton, you know, over the course of my career, I spent a lot of time up there and even somebody like me who really dad, did have that level of appreciation, both because of how beaten down I was and getting some proximity to see it up close, it's hard to look at the last few years, even with multiple MVPs, and look at him, the scenario, or the yeah. story in the same way. No. It'll just never be that way. And as a football player, what he did as a fuck you to those guys after the Jordan Love pick is almost more impressive if you were going to put that in his resume. But the yeah. way that we talk about him, the way the Packers fans will probably remember him, and the way that football fans in general consider him, I think gets changed forever based on a lot of things that have happened over the last two or three years. Yeah, I don't, and I don't want to say a, a, a bad taste in your mouth, but a different taste in your mouth. That, yeah. that, that, that's kind of how I feel about this, and it's one of those where – Sometimes you don't, I, I, no, I don't want to talk about that, but sometimes you just like, you don't almost don't want to hear anything from, you just want to watch the player and appreciate yeah, the player. I'm, I'm good. And it's like, like, that's... It's separate, separate. It's like that watching an actor in a role. It's like, I don't want to know anything about your personal life. I love you in this role. Just you're, you're amazing. And it's I think a great that's comparison. Kind of, that's and that, that's kind of how I, like I felt today. It yeah. was just like, just let me know when it's over. Like, yeah, just let me know where he's going. And like the fact same. that that's how we feel about it is a little bit of it a sucks. bummer now. Yeah, so not everyone to be great in both both aspects, but it's very rarely that case. So on the Jets side of this, again, I almost felt like it had to happen for them. On a football level, like what do you think you can expect from Aaron Rodgers in a Jets uniform with those guys? Oh man. Well, which players are coming with them? <laughs> uh, okay, but, uh, all right. Let, yeah. Let's say, let's say the Garrett Wilson, Alan Lazard, Elijah yeah. Moore, Bryce 
Hall or Brees Hall kind of quad yeah. with, with him at this point. I think, uh, I mean, with the Hackett offense, what, if I'm taking what they ran with the Packers with Hackett, it was a greatest hits offense. So you're going to see a lot of the, uh, um, you're going to see a lot more gun runs because Rodgers kind of prefers to be in the gun. Uh, I see some play action, quick hitting play action. I bet you he hits a ton to Garrett Wilson. There are going to be so many in breakers that he'll throw to him. Um, heavy RPO usage as far as bubbles and flats and uh, smoke screens. You know, they loves getting those into there. I think there's going to be a lot of carryover from that last year of Hackett being there with Broder. So two years ago, <laughs> Hackett only Hackett was one and done. So <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't that long ago that I have to refer to. Um, but I think that kind of last offense there this past year, they really leaned into the run game, especially the gun run game, the pony personnel and everything. So I think there's a little difference from that, but I think you'll see Garrett Wilson with a lot of in breakers, a lot of quick hitters, um, I, Lazard being Lazard, especially on third down, but that's where I picture as far as the passing game is they're going to really lean into that. A lot of quick hitting, offensive stuff he hasn't really he doesn't really push the ball over the middle anymore he likes to throw a lot of inside fades and go balls and quick hitting stuff he doesn't really attack over the middle but that's fine um i think this offensive personnel is more conducive to kind of that vertical and outside yak stuff as opposed to the inside yak stuff another quick worthwhile rogers note jeff howe from the athletic reported that the raiders in fact also called about aaron Rodgers, and that the raiders also called the bears about the number one pick so Certainly feels like Jimmy G is a stepping stone for the Raiders right now on their way to whatever quarterback they feel like is That's, the real solution, which we kind of thought was the answer after thought. we saw that contract. That was I dropped one of my first quasi scoops on this show. It was that the Raiders were sniffing around with that top pick. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I thought it was had been reported. So <laughs> I would have maybe leaned into that a little bit a little bit more if I knew that. Uh but yeah, it makes sense. Like we said, we're trying they, the Raiders seem like they're straddling, like trying to they're trying to figure out exactly the path they want to go on. They bring back Jakob Johnson, which I think is hilarious. So I just have one little aside about that is that I want to tell Josh McDaniels that, you know, fullbacks can catch passes now too. Like you can get some athletic dudes like an Alec Ingold, you know, or maybe not use check, but you get, you can find a guy that doesn't just have to be a plugger fullback from, you know, 2002 as your fullback. So I just want to throw that aside there too. So also Jeff, how reported that the Patriots have been looking around into DeAndre Hopkins, Juju Smith Schuster, Odell Beckham. And then about three minutes after I put that in my rundown in Rappaport reports that Juju Smith Schuster yep. is heading to the Patriots three years, $33 million. I don't, I didn't see a guarantee number on there yet. I don't know if that's been reported, but that three for 33 number is pretty much exactly what Jacoby yeah. Myers got. And Jacoby Myers' reaction to this is pretty much my reaction to this. It's like, ooh, that's pretty cold. Like, yeah. you essentially just told me uh, you'd rather have Juju Smith-Schuster than me for pretty much the exact same money. I don't know if I would. I don't either. I think also similar roles and similar, similar a lot of things. Like, Juju's a better blocker. I would say that. But I don't know. As far as pass catchers and what they do, it's kind of the exact same <laughs> Player. it's kind of funny i actually think myers is a little better on the outside i i that's yeah it doesn't it's a very lateral move for the same money for and you you see with all these signings that have happened in this free agency is a good emphasis coaches like their players that they know they don't like branching off into new territory with different players so that that's why i think it's interesting usually you see the other like they prefer to bring back their the guy that they have and they won't get a comp pick out of Myers either no, because it pretty much erases that, yeah, it. erases it. So there's not even that benefit as well. So I just thought too is that the Patriots would maybe add a little more speed to the receiving room. Uh, uh something that's kind of where I'm at with it. Is like that... one Thornton can be that guy, but I thought they'd add a little more, a little more juice to that receiving room. So if this is the move, right? If this is like the splash for them with their receiving options. I'm not overly excited about the Patriots pass catching options. If the group is Juju, Devontae Parker, Tyquan Thornton, and Kendrick Bourne, no offense to Kendrick Bourne. And no, no, offense no to you. I get Sorry, it. buddy. No, I get it. I get it. I think they feel the same way too, based on his snap count the last year. <laughs> um, but no, that's not, no Juju, Juju fit, fit perfectly with what the chiefs had. And I, you know, he's not, that was his role and everything, but it just, there's that, that vertical element just seems that it's the outside go ball contested catch element. Not the like juice, yak guy you know what i mean that's what yeah. i kind of thought they would have and again everybody wants that type of player but it's just kind of a hat on a hat that maybe that's that's a good way to put it of how that kind of pairing is 
They signed Riley Reef also in free agency. They, they brought in Calvin Anderson. So I don't know. It feels like they're probably going to need to add a right tackle somewhere along the way, potentially yeah. high in the draft, unless they yeah. think one of those guys is going to start based on the way that they played last year and the money that they spent on all of them. I don't know if they see any of those guys as a starting caliber right tackle at this yeah. stage of things. All right. It really seems like a draft candidate for them. I, I I could see them that being a priority, especially where they're picking. That's yeah, really they could probably they could probably those find guys, them in the first round. The value kind of makes sense for them in the first round, I think. I still just I'm really hoping for their sake that the upgrade from Matt Patricia to Bill O'Brien is enough to get a lot more out of their offense because personnel wise, I don't know how much better their offensive personnel is right now than it was at the end of last season when they were pretty forgettable on that side of the ball. Yeah. Very yeah, just very forgettable. The the stories coming out about that about their offensive system and practicing has been pretty fascinating as well. But yeah, it just didn't it didn't feel like a needle mover. It felt just like a lateral move, and I thought that they maybe add find a interesting guy to add some juice to that room. So not like mad or anything, just kind of shrug the shoulders. It, it, that, that's kind of my thought. It's just like yeah, yeah I, I, I it's, it's it's a shrug. Just okay, yeah, it's a shrug and it's an okay and it's a I really don't know how much more we can expect from them outside of we got a major upgrade with our pass with our play caller and yep. potentially with <laughs> the, the mindset and buy-in of our quarterback as a result of that. Yeah. Maybe that'll help. <laughs> maybe the relationship will, will blossom some flowers for the offense a little bit <laughs> when the quarterback actually talks to the offensive coordinator. <laughs> All right. So one that happened immediately after we got done recording yesterday to the point that I was very pissed off about it. The Cowboys trade for Stefan Gilmore, according to Tom Pelissero and many other people, I'm sure, in yeah. the last 24 hours. A fifth round pick heading back to Indy. Only an $8 million base salary this year for Stefan Gilmore. We thought that Jalen Ramsey might be an option for the mm -hmm. Cowboys. We saw at the end of last season, they had a pretty huge hole at their other outside corner spot. It was really a monstrous question for them heading into the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And now at least temporarily, they fill it. I don't think that there was a better answer out there after the Ramsey trade for them to find somebody that would be a major upgrade and not cost a ton than a move like this to go get Stephon Gilmore. It's obviously no, not it, a long-term thing, but no. I don't think that's really what they're looking for here. No, they're not. At 32, he played well last year. He played and well. This is, he did. And I don't, like you said, I don't think there's many there are better options as far as resources kind of like spent on this. Exactly. They're not splurging. They're not sending day one, day two picks. Okay, this is fine. I mean, especially for what they're – they did well with what they trotted out there. Gilmore's going to be an upgrade for any of those guys. And what the Cowboys leaned into in coverage last year, a lot of man coverage and cover two. A lot of cover two helps with old aging corners to kind of mm -hmm. take a break a little bit, and he's a smart corner. That makes a lot of sense. That's what you want as a cover two corner. And he can live in man coverage. Just a, I mean, Gus Bradley was still running a lot of cover he's three He's played last everything. Year. He played, he played with Gus Bradley last year. Yep. He played a ton of man coverage when he was in New England. Yep. I mean, they played a lot of zone when he was in Carolina He's for so that very smart. short, a... very unfortunate time based on what I've heard <laughs> about right. Stephon Gilmore's time there. But he's done a little bit of everything, and I think that's why it's a smart bet for a Cowboys team that really does a little bit of everything. Yep. And I, uh, so yep. the avenue – I like it. He's, I, he's I, corner two for him. Like, you know, I like it. Yeah, I know. Overall, that's I like this. I it think makes it a, a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. If you're just looking for somebody to fill that spot and you're not yep. trying to overextend yourself, I think this is a really smart way to do it. And yeah. there were a lot of guys on this team, on defensively specifically, that were potentially going to move on this offseason. And they're retaining a lot of them. Yeah. Leighton Van Der Esch comes back on a two-year deal worth about $8 million up to eleven. Almost none of it is guaranteed. He is a Smart. two and a half million dollar cap hit this year, I believe. Four million dollar cap hit next year. I think only a million dollars of next year's cap hit is guaranteed. I think this is from Todd Archer of ESPN. So did not spend a lot to bring him back. You get a familiar face in the middle of your defense. And then they also re-signed Donovan Wilson. Three years, $21 million, $13 million guaranteed. So they retain that trio of safeties that they have. Yes. And oftentimes the trio of safeties becoming another linebacker in some of those packages that they use. And then with the way that Deron Bland played for them in the yeah. slot last year, and Jordan Lewis is also on this team. They've got a lot of bodies now in the back seven. And I think it's easy to get excited about what this defense can be again with Dan Quinn coming back with them, able to retain a lot of the major pieces that made this thing go last season. 
Yeah, and the, how they, I mean, the, no one uses their DBs more, I think, than the Cowboys. I mean, I know the Bills stay in nickel, but the Cowboys are like, let's go dime. Let's get six of these guys out there on first and second down. But they have these unique body types, like you just alluded to. Like J.R. Curse is the safety or the tight end eraser for them. But so that when they go, man, they just plop him on whatever tight end or big body they need to defend. Donovan Wilson's kind of the, I don't know, almost like a will linebacker for them like he does a ton of different stuff he does everything all over the place yep yeah and it's yeah it makes sense a lot of these pieces make sense i'm like way more interested in this db room by them keeping some guys like it's kind of fun like as opposed to going like man how are they if they lost donovan wilson i've been like man that's he does just lost flexibility yeah and maintaining the flexibility i think is important it's almost the opposite of what's happening with the Bengals right now where the Bengals could do so many of those things with all those bodies they had back there. And now those bodies are gone. So it's like, Oh, I wonder what yeah. the Bengals are going to do. And I think that you know, when Rumo is like, plenty of respect coming <laughs> from the side of the, of the table yeah. on the show. But <laughs> yeah. I think it's one of those things where the Cowboys are on the other end of that, where they brought all these guys back and now they can build on a lot of stuff that they've done. So the Cowboys yeah. spending some money on Gilmore on those free agents on defense, they're going to have to save some money somewhere. And it sounds like part of that plan is to release Ezekiel Elliott. There's designating him as a first June 1st cut. Clarence Hill from the Fort Worth Star Telegram was the first person to report this, I believe, but others have since. Uh, writing was on the wall. You know, yeah. Jerry Jones said earlier in the offseason that they were going to try to bring him back, but I just don't know how you can justify him, even at a slightly reworked price tag, along with Tony Pollard, who is playing on the tag right now. I've got to imagine they try to get him on an extension to get that number down. And also with Zeke not there anymore, you could probably commit to Tony Pollard in a multi-year way. So we'll see what the running back room ends up looking like. But the first stage of things here is that Zeke Elliott's days are done in Dallas. I'm just, I'm just glad they bit the bullet like on it. Finally, it's like, okay, I know that was probably hard for Jerry. He, he likes his running backs. He likes his guys. Um, Yeah. But like you said, it felt inevitable. And with, Pollard coming off the injury, you know, I, I think it actually makes more sense in a weirdest way to have him long term because you're not going to get the benefit of him this year, the full Tony Pollard experience this year on the tag. So it would make sense for kind of a midterm extension. I don't know how else to, to describe it, but that would make a lot of sense. Real quick before, too, is that on the Leighton Vander Esch was we talked about him late in the season, especially in December, and also just I wrote about him, and he shored up a lot with that Cowboys defense against the run. And and what he his role now is kind of maybe a little different than what I expected him when he entered the league. But he's just a solid kind of – I call him the Makalele, the soccer player role, which is the cleanup role for the Real Madrid star teams where he just – none of those guys play defense. And he was just like, okay, I got to clean everything up for everybody else. The Cowboys defense is very aggressive. Guys can go rogue. That was – Van Der Esch, it was very important for them being sustainable so they didn't get gashed as much as they used to in the past. So I just want to kind of compliment him and re-signing him actually, I think is a nice, I think that was a nice kind of fair deal for both sides, especially like you said, there's no guaranteed money, but it's a stabilizing force. Yes. Uh, The fact that you just kind of keep that group together. And again, you don't have to worry about it. I can totally understand that plan. If you're Dallas and I can understand that plan. If you're those guys, yeah. Like, you got a good thing Why going Gilmore? down yes. there. If you're not getting all this guaranteed money elsewhere to go play for a different team, a different city, a different coach, people seem to love playing for Dan Quinn. Yes, they do. I, I can totally understand how those guys kind of took a look around, saw the landscape and said, you know what? I think we're better it's, off just staying home. They're going to use me right. They're, they know what I am. Like there's, there's a huge benefit for that. Like <laughs> you can maybe chase an extra 500 grand or an extra million, but sometimes getting used right and where you look good really matters. I don't know if it's really worth relitigating all the Ezekiel Elliott stuff. I mean, this guy was a top five pick. He was yeah. one of the biggest stars in the league at one point, you know, came in with Dak kind of defined that era of Cowboys football, but mm-hmm. well, we've talked so many times about how misguided that extension was, how unnecessary it was to do it as early as they did. They hung on too long. It, it, I don't know if it's worth revisiting all of that because no. I think we've talked about it plenty over the last couple of years. Zeke is probably my, favorite running back prospect i've i've watched in since i kind of officially have done it so probably the past decade and where were you at that 2016 where were you you're in oakland? i was with i was going to oakland yeah. i was with the falcons that spring and then left to oakland right after the draft and i mean his tape was just unbelievable and just like it as opposed to a guy like saquon who you could see just the sheer talent Saquon has a running style that I'll never grade as high because he's so chaotic. He has kind of yeah. more of the creativity and stuff. Zeke he was is just a, tr- a force of nature. Force of nature. Yeah. yeah. Zeke was a running back, like a true running back and fast and big and tough and smart. 
his pass protection, he was showing that in college. And you don't see that. He was willing to do the dirty work as a blocker. Um, but and Zeke just, you know, when he entered the league, it was he was a force with that offensive line, especially. But yeah, like you said, the contract was misguided, but it doesn't take away just because he was overpaid, doesn't take away what a good player he was for a long stretch of that career before as running backs kind of fall off. But I I I, I Zeke the prospect and Zeke the player really appreciate him, really respect him. So I hope like hope this isn't the end <laughs> you know i hope that there's gonna be i'm a sure he'll land that, somewhere I as, hope a, he, as I a hope thumper so. for you know a, a fairly short-term deal on a team that just needs running back snaps yeah sticking in the nfc east here the eagles secondary getting some shakeups over the last 24 hours bit of a surprise they bring back james bradbury three years yeah. 38 million dollars 20 million dollars guaranteed according to adam schefter feels like an extension of the conversation we had yesterday about the state of the cornerback market, Mm -hmm. not a monstrous deal. Bradbury came out yesterday publicly and said that he had better offers offers elsewhere, wanted to stay in Philadelphia, felt like they were on the brink of a championship, could really do something, which understandable considering the way (laughs) the last season went. The deal he got, about $13 million a year, $20 million guaranteed, pretty much the same deal that Jamel Dean got yesterday. Right. So this is where that market has settled. G- Dean, obviously much younger mm-hmm. than James Bradbury, but James Bradbury was a borderline all pro pro yes. bowl level player last year. So yes, he was. I, this price tag for that kind of guy over the next two years, if you're Philadelphia, I, I think you can easily get on board with it. Yeah. Especially it's probably going to be more like a two year deal. So right when he hits yeah. that, that 30, 30 year cliff, which he's going to hit this year, but Bradbury's game isn't that too. And that's why he's a corner. I would be willing to bet on. We've talked about how smart he was. He's now succeeded in several different schemes. Um, I mean that I've mentioned this multiple times that interception he had against Trevor Lawrence when they played the Jaguars on week three or whatever it was, was one of the coolest corner plays of this entire year, him reading out this play. And anybody that doesn't know what I'm talking about, look it up, just Twitter search it. (laughs) Uh, But this makes sense. I mean, it makes sense. The The Eagles are kind of losing a couple other their defensive pieces. Bradbury is one I'd be willing to extend, even if he is turning 30. I, I am surprised, though. I did think that he would be going somewhere else. But like you said, he had the quote that he, want, they th- he thinks they're close. So that makes sense as well. Well, we have some other moving pieces here because it sounds like they're going to release Darius Slay or did yes. release Darius Slay. They're going to designate him as a post-June first cut, which would and save his, 17 and a half market is gap space. booming right now. Uh, from what I've gathered, it's uh, a lot of teams are sniffing around uh, at Slay right now. If you, which team do you think makes the most sense? Which team do you think should be most motivated to make that happen? Man, put you on the spot. I know. I know the Jaguars are sniffing, and I actually wouldn't mind that, even though I think they need pass rush help more than anything. But he's 32. That's the other thing that you have to remember. He's 32. Yes. And so it's like Jaguars are not kind of, I don't know, Jaguars aren't kind of like in that by the vet world. I don't know, actually. Now that I'm really thinking about it, who would I want him to see with? Man, I don't know. I really don't know. I, the, give Jags me, give me, are, the Jags are interesting. That's that's the one that I would think is the most interesting because I think the Jags think they can make a little mini push this year. So that would be one that not not a bad mercenary to go after, especially because their resources they're kind of tied down, and you know it's not like they have a boatload of picks like they had a couple last couple of years. So it's kind of that's one where it's like that would make sense for finding that type. Of, they need another corner, so that would make sense to just get through. I would love that as a mercenary as long as it's just a one year kind of flyer on them. Giants still probably have a need a corner. They don't. Yeah. They still have a little bit of money to throw around. The Lions started with a need a corner. Don't really have as much. The of Lions would more. But also, yeah, <laughs> the prior history. <laughs> oh yeah, I didn't think about that. God. Yeah, I know. You, he's got, throw, you I know. throw teams out. It's like when I was talking about DeAndre Hopkins getting traded to New England, and I just wasn't even <laughs> wasn't even thinking about the uh, Bill the O'Brien. Side yeah, ramifications. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what about I mean. so here? This is the one that would be the most fun, and I, who knows if they would do it. But him going to Seattle, that was one. And yeah. I know they uh, they liked the other corner that they drafted last year. Um, the kid from Cincinnati, I'm blanking on his name right now. Kobe, Kobe uh, Bryant, but he Kobe was, Bryant. He, was, he played in the slot for the slot though. So that's that's what I was gonna be, say. He's, he's gonna a be slot. Him yeah. in the slot, Tariq Woolen, Darius Slay, who I think is very good friends with Quandre Diggs. Yes, I is. believe from their time in Detroit together. So that would be an interesting one. I think, I think of all the potential outcomes, that would be the one I'd be most interested in, but there's a chance that Seattle wants to use one of those premium picks that they have or first round picks. They have on a corner. Yes. Just be younger at the it's position. A, it's a nice corner class in this year's draft. So as far as like top 50 players, there's about five, six guys there that guys teams are interested in. It sounded like Slay wanted a new deal. 
and yep. just wasn't going to get it from the Eagles. And so they just felt it was easiest to, to move on. He had a pretty big cap number this year. So I assume that dealing his contract was a little bit tougher and, than it is for somebody like Stefan Gilmore, who's eight million against the cap this season. And this is the interesting thing too: is like I, I believe uh, Bradbury was your second team All Pro, and Slay yeah. was my second team All Pro. That's how good these guys were last year. But that also why we bring up the age stuff is I'd be more willing to give the twenty nine year old about to turn thirty than the thirty two year old just for that position, if all things are considered equal. Yeah. And that that's kind of just want to kind of map it out like why you would pick one or the other. Well, I picked the one that's slightly younger just because of data, <laughs> just because of life experience in the NFL of how corners age. $17 million base salary for Darius Slay this year. Okay. So that a little bit harder to move than something like the Gilmore deal. Man, yeah, CX actually can, could eat that. So that's not, that's not terrible. <laughs> Some more cornerback news. The Vikings signed Byron Murphy. Uh, original numbers on that were a little inflated. It sounds like the actual numbers are coming in at about two years and $17 million with about $12.5 million guaranteed. So what that amounts to really is a one-year flyer on Byron Murphy for the Vikings that's going to cost them upwards of like $12 million. So this is the second time they've done this. They did the exact same thing essentially with Marcus Davenport earlier this week. So they're kind of taking these swings that they feel like are high upside swings with very little long-term risk associated with them, which I don't think is the worst idea in the world. I don't either. This is how you get kind of better players than you're paying for. If if it goes right. Yes, of course. Injuries, injury guys like Byron Murphy has some stuff. I think he has a backs thing, Um, but it's an under market deal for a good player. Uh, And you're not finding a young player, a a young young player. player. That, Marcus and, Davenport's the same. And say if he hits, say like Murphy hits, and I know there's cap stuff you have to figure out, but like next year, now their training staff and their team kind of knows what he is. And you, that's what you're paying for a little bit. It's kind of like a little, you're paying for a sneak preview of maybe someone you might be interested in a year. So that. And they and have a contract next year. They can keep yeah. him next year. Oh, yeah, so that's it's, true. It's not yeah, like yeah, Davenport it's where no, it's no. truly a one-year yeah, deal. Yeah. It is a two-year deal, but it's still a it's it's a one-year deal in practice because they can move on if they move want on to. From. So it's even better than the Davenport deal in the sense that you get the upside of a low risk move, but you can keep him a little bit under market next year if he does end up working out. You're, and that's the thing is you're, uh, we're talking about resources. We're just talking about, you know, the Gilmore to the Cowboys. You're not spending premium money and you're not spending a premium draft pick on a guy that's going to be a legit co- a starter for you at a good position or a position that's hard to find legit good starters. So I like it for a team that's trying to straddle the line and trying to figure out exactly their path. I like this. This is the kind of bets you make that, that, that can hit and like really go, oh, wow, we figured that one out. Wow. We got them under market price too. Yeah. The only thing that really was, went against that a tiny bit is them committing to Garrett Bradbury for multiple years in the way that they did based on how up and down his play has been. But I think at that position, they're just prioritizing familiarity. That's what it is. And he, he was better last year, but still just slow average ish. Well, I think, <laughs> um, I think the problem is that they saw what life was like without him at the end of the yeah. season. And when they saw what life was like with the downgrade and then another downgrade, when they they're, were on center uh, number three, they're like, uh, you know what? Let's go with the first guy. <laughs> that life wasn't that bad when he was in there. Remember when I, I've said this line, when you, you have crap to average, like it can feel a lot better life. Yeah. That, they went the opposite. They went from average to crap and they're like, oh, I don't really like this life. Let's yeah, let's get right back to it. And honestly, I think it was a pretty fair deal. It was like three for 15 or something like that. It wasn't like too bad. It wasn't backbreaking. So I'm, I'm fine with that. All right. Some more NFC North news. The Lions signing David Montgomery, according to Ian Rappaport, three years, $18 million, $11 million guaranteed. Just feels like this is them getting a little bit younger at that role within their offense. David Montgomery is 25. Jamal Williams is 28. He was going to be on contract number three. They saw a way to kind of shave three years off of that thumper running back role within yeah. this offensive system. That's yeah. kind of what it feels like to me. That's exactly what it feels like. And I love this fit. Uh uh, as uh, everyone loves Jamal Williams, uh, and he's he, it's a great personality. Great I have person. said that the Jamal Williams era in Detroit is over because he was such it's, a good fit for who they've been personality wise over the last couple of years. He was, but it's like this is the the thing that this is this is hard about sometimes with life in the NFL. It's like Montgomery is a load of a better player <laughs> than Jamal Williams. As much as I like Jamal Williams, I think he's gonna be a lot of fun behind that Lions offensive line. Uh, 
love this fit that being at 25 like you mentioned uh, i really like this one i think it's gonna be really exciting to watch um but yeah i am kind of sad about the jamal williams thing he'll find he'll find plenty of teams he is a very useful player as a pass protector and a short yardage guy those those guys can find a home pretty quickly do i think jamal, I, I guess david montgomery is a better player than jamal williams oh yeah the, the, the degree to which he is i i think we can oh, talk sure. about but i I think you're probably I'm right. right. It's I'm just more, like it's more popular. Than no, no, no. You're right. Yeah, yeah. You're 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 right though. He he gives him more wiggle. I mean, yeah. I think there are a lot of different elements to his game that are a little bit different than what Jamal Williams. Jamal, Jamal Williams is going to get what he bought. What, uh, that's why he's so he's so good in short yards. Is yeah. if you block for him to get that one yard, he's, he's the hammer. Like, he's getting that one yard. Like yeah. he's guaranteed to get it. It's that he doesn't have that kind of. You know, if it's blocked for four, he'll get you five. You know, he can get you a little bit, but I think Montgomery has that kind of little bit more to him, a little bit more juice, a little bit more all aroundness to his game than Jamal Williams, like I said, is more of a short yardage, uh, pass protecting guy that got kind of pushed into more of a prominent role. I mean, he took it and ran with it, but pun intended. But it, it's that Dave Montgomery, I think, just overall can do more with less. I'd like Jamal Williams to land somewhere fun. I think we threw out the Chargers when we were talking about some potential spots for him, potential ways that they could go. I think that would be a really good one. Yeah. I, I, I still want Williams with the chargers. I still think would be a fun one, even though everyone got mad at me for throwing that one out there. I mean, I think they got mad at you because the Austin Eckler stuff hadn't Detroit. happened yet. And he yeah. was leaving Detroit, but now he's leaving Detroit and Austin Eckler just asked for a trade. So, all right. Not bad. Not, not the worst one. Some quarterback news to dig into here. This happened right before we started recording. Jacoby Brissett signs with the Washington football team. One year, $8 million, according to Jeremy Fowler, up to $10 million. This is the kind of deal we thought Jacoby Brissett would get. Yep. I, I wasn't sure what Washington's quarterback plan was going to be outside of Sam Hall. I, I think that they had said you know, through back channels that they were trying to bring in some sort of veteran presence mm-hmm. to push Sam Howell and this is arguably the best veteran presence on a stopgap option that they could have had among all the guys and the way they played last year. I think Jacoby Brissett was probably the best option available in this market. I, I, I totally agree. I, I would much rather have him than Baker. Like I, yeah. I really would. Um, I, this makes a lot of sense. We were wondering what Washington was done at doing at quarterback when Andy Dalton uh, spoilers signed with, with the Panthers, this kind of felt like a dom. I was like, Oh, okay. That's okay. You're not going there. Okay. This opens up the other spots. Cause I just thought with the Frank Reich background and all that Jimmy G going to the Raiders kind of felt like, okay, what seats are open? Cause he's worthy of being a stopgap starter for somebody and a high end backup for somebody. And this one makes a ton of sense as far as fit and what he could bring. I thought that Carolina made the most sense just with his connection to Frank Reich and what yeah. they would potentially need at that position. But if you're Jacoby Brissett, I can understand not wanting to go to Carolina where you know that they're going to take a guy with yeah. the number one pick. You yeah. don't want to be sitting there and have your seat warm from the moment you take yeah. over on the first day of training camp. Oh, fun way to now, <laughs> he's, now he's battling against Sam Howell, yeah. who is, is not the number one pick. For as much as the, it was Washington has tried to pump up how much they like Sam Howell, it's a slightly different dynamic when the guy was a fifth rounder a year ago compared to CJ Stroud coming in as the number one overall pick. Correct. And yeah, and more or less he, he can look and go, yeah, I think I'm going to start. <laughs> I think this, I think I, I don't know. I just think, I think we all know this and I think that's what he thinks too. No, I totally get that. It, it's a hard way to live when, and, and when Andy Dalton signed with, where it was with the bears and, you know, they drafted Justin Fields, I get it as knowing like, am I number one? Like you signed me to be this guy. I, I, some guys don't want to be the mentor. And I get that. Like there's not, a, you, it's not every guy's Alex Smith. You know, that's just like so great with it. And so I think that if that. Jacoby, if a team did it right, I think Jacoby Brissett would be fine living that way. Yeah. I mean, he is, Mr. my understanding, teammate. a very affable personality. Uh, but like, Mr. Yeah, everyone loves Everyone him. loves like, Jacoby Brissett. Everybody, including but me. I've met him when, twice. Love him. <laughs> but when you are, when you have the opportunity to really be a starter, like he yeah. seems to in Washington, where the quarterback would be a surprise rather than something you can see coming from a million miles away. Yeah. I understand it. Also, Washington has some real guys to throw the football to. Correct. Like, I, I think it's important to remember in watching Washington's offense over the last few years, what Taylor Heineke and Carson Wentz are. Yeah. especially Wentz at this stage of his career versus even the, the play that Jacoby Brissett showed last year in Washington. Like that is a step up from what Washington or what showed last year in Cleveland. That is a step up from what Washington has experienced at the quarterback position yes. over the last, their last like four to five seasons. True. So I think yeah. we could see like the best version of Terry McLaurin we've ever seen with Jacoby Brissett. And I'm excited yes. to see that. 
I think which uh, people that have never watched Jacoby Brissett or anything, it, it's there's a classic line about a good jockey in in horse racing that a good jockey might not win you a race, but he won't lose it for you. And that's what Jacoby Brissett feels like. He's going to do everything right. And so if you and with Eric Bieniemy and and what their offense might be, I completely agree with the sentiment you just threw out there that throwing it to those weapons with Jahan Dotson as well and and Terry, scary Terry. That's interesting because he's going to find out ways to get those guys the ball. I mean, look at what Amari Cooper was doing with Jacoby. Yes, the offensive line was fantastic in Cleveland, but he's going to know how to get the guys the ball with the plays designed for those guys. Like, he's not going to screw it up for you. Yeah, and I'm excited to see that. Obviously, Eric Bieniemy is a question mark in terms of what he's going to be as an offensive coordinator, but yeah. the weapons are certainly in place. And, you know, they've done – they've made moves to shore up spots along the offensive line, right? Yep. They bring in Andrew Wiley, so Wiley, not a yep. group full of stars – but I think their hopes, a group full of five functional pieces that which Gobi Brissett and those pass catchers, you can be a mid-tier offense. Yeah. And for them, that would be an improvement from right. what they've been over the last few years. I mean, they were right. scraping by to like 22nd in DVOA a couple of years ago with Scott Turner squeezing everything he could everything. out of that thing as Taylor Heineke was just what, what, like stuntman playing quarterback the way that you like to describe it. So hopefully things are a little bit calmer now. <laughs> with Jacoby in town than they've been yeah. over the last couple of years. Yeah, a little different than Johnny Knoxville running around back there. <laughs> this is more like, I don't know, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman playing quarterback for you. Like he's going to he's gonna get the role done <laughs> and be really, really good at it. Like he's whatever you ask him to do, he's going to get that function. That Philip Seymour Hoffman's probably that's, way, that's too way too way good. Too good. Tr- way too good. Way too rich. I'm, I'm, trying uh, to th- I'm trying to think of somebody who's just like who's, there. Who was the dad in, uh, not the dad, uh, the main actor in Friday Night Lights, that guy. that that's in, Kyle Chandler. Like, yeah, Kyle Chandler. That's what I'm going with. Oh, man, I think even that's like just to Kyle Chandler. I feel like they're shooting a little bit too low with that even still. <laughs> we'll find a good one. We'll yeah, we'll find, find a good one. one. We got another half hour. We, uh, we can I mean, one up. <laughs> sticking with the quarterback news here, Baker Thank Mayfield, you. one year, yeah. eight and a half million to go to Tampa. This had been rumored. Yeah. I don't Fine. I don't know what I don't know what to make. Less than Sam Darnold, I think. Than, than uh, Sam Sam God. I, I think. I Less than? It. I think it was, I, it's one year, eight and a half million. I, what did Sammy get? Oh, I, think this Sammy. Is, I think it's more than what Sammy No, I think, I think you might be right, but I might have just been. I mean, this is like, right. this is stopgap starter money. I mean, it's essentially yeah. the same deal that Percet got. To, and that, 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 that is what the the Bucks view oh, yeah. Baker Mayfield has this year to compete with Kyle Trask. Forget, forget about that line that he's made more than Sam got. Forget that line. <laughs> that was that was me just mixing up my numbers. <laughs> I was gonna say I don't think Sam Darnold's getting paid to be like a stopgap starter like Baker is in Tampa. <laughs> just just a strange team. So they bring back Levante David. Yeah. So now they have essentially their defense mm-hmm. back in place, and the offense minus Donovan Smith. So most of that roster, which minus we, Shaq Mason, they traded him, and, and then they traded Shaq Mason. Yeah. So just kind of feels like they're trying to keep as much of this together as possible, be mildly competitive in the short term yeah. and then see what happens next year. I think so that's I, I think that if they could click SIM to end here with this season, just kind of get to 2024, they might be into that idea. That's kind yeah. of what this feels like. Baker is a like, get me to the end of the line quarterback for the bucks. Yeah. That's what he was for the Rams in December too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's exactly what it felt like. Um, yeah, this is uh Yeah. It felt like this was in the cards. Like you said, there's so much smoke about it. So I'm not like surprised, uh, but the, like, and we're just figuring out the bucks. The bucks have a lot of talent. So I get kind of this thinking that they're like, well, let's see what, see how this year goes and see what we can get out of it. I mean, they were, I think this was the one team that I saw Zeke might get rumored to, which was kind of like as, as the guy that holds 99% of Rashad White stock, I'm like, no, please stop. Please, <laughs> so we don't need another plotting aging back uh, with, with Rashad White. Uh, but no, I, I think this is that's what they're trying to do with Baker. Baker is just the stop, getting the stop gap and see what's going on in 2023 and see what we got with everybody else. One more bit of quarterback news in the NFC South specifically. Andy Dalton going to Carolina. Two years, $10 million, $8 million guaranteed. This is the veteran, Wiley veteran to help raise the young guy role yeah. and contract for Andy Dalton in Carolina. Yes, it is. I having this type of vet makes me because of what these kind of prospects are in this quarterback draft, you know, Stroud is kind of considered, considered pretty polished and all that. And Anthony Richardson's kind of more of a wild card and more of a project quote unquote, even though spoilers for whenever I talk about these guys, don't think he's much of a project as people think he is, but 
I don't know. That made it interesting to me. It was like, oh, so you do want that kind of vet in there. So I think you, it's ooh. always helpful. I right? know. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. like an even in Houston uh, signing. Uh, uh, what's his face? The uh, la, 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 sorry, Case Keenum. Case Keenum. Yeah. Which was like, that's like, we've, oh, we've yeah, seen this that. all over the place. Right. I mean, the, yes. the Bengals didn't really do it. But the Chargers did it with Chase Daniel. Chase Daniel, yeah. Uh, obviously, Alex Smith was in place and Patrick Mahomes got yep. there. We're seeing with Andy Dalton now. I think this is a pretty normal thing. You know, Case Keenum just went to Buffalo with Josh Allen when he was early in his career. Yes. Derek Anderson was there with Josh Allen fairly early in his career. So I think I a lot that. of teams are are smart in the way that they handle this. I, I remember Barnwell it, when I used to talk about this back in the day because I think Josh McCown got signed somewhere to be their backup. And it was for – more expensive in those days dollars than mm-hmm. a deal like this would be. We were kind of talking about how much value that has. Isn't like a coach supposed to be that factor. But when you have a, a veteran in the room that is one of the players and can really show a guy how to go about his work and like, this is how you operate in the building. This is yes. what you should be like in meetings. Like, I think yeah. there is real value in that and talking to players about it. So even if you have a guy in Stroud who you think is a little bit more polished, I do think that there is something to having this sort of presence there for a young quarterback and a young Whole, offensive roster. I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, having that kind of almost like a player coach. Yes. And cause sometimes they translate things better than the coaches can. The coaches, especially during the season are in, in their bubble and going like, Hey, we're in meetings and we, by finally we get to the players. We're coming out with a million ideas. And sometimes the quarterback has to talk to somebody else and go like, how do you read that too? Oh, okay. Okay. I get that. That makes a lot of sense to me. I think the best things outside of co- good coaching, of course, the best things you can give to a young quarterback is a vet like that. Uh, a, hopefully a younger vet that started before. And on top of it, a center. Those are the two things for a young quarterback that I think are conducive to, to success down the road, or at least make the transition easier. A veteran, a center that knows what the frick they're doing and a backup quarterback that kind of can really help guide them. But like you said, there's a lot to it. And you're hearing all these whispers with Kyler and everything. And, and it's not really whispers anymore. Everybody talks about it, but as far as like as a quarterback, you might have the meetings. Meetings start at eight thirty, and they go to you know whatever eleven, and then you're on the practice field. Yada yada. Everyone's schedule is different. You have other meetings to do, like with your quarterback coach, and then even before you meet with your quarterback coach, you might have to study before that. So you're in that building at six six thirty, and people think, oh well, that's just the brouhaha of being in the NFL life. It's like no, because there's that that much shit to learn. It, it's so much that's put on your plate, and some of these guys they get into the NFL. It's like, oh, I. Oh man, my private quarterback coach that put me through three hours of drills didn't tell me about this stuff. <laughs> like that's the transition they have to get to and used to. So having a vet that goes like, "Hey, this isn't that crazy." Like you actually have to be in there at six thirty to like get those stuff. That really does matter. Really does help to succeed in the NFL. I remember talking to guys with the Chargers last year, maybe two years ago, when they brought Chase Daniel in, just about the value of a guy like that. And the way that they communicated to me is that it also can it help a quarterback find his own voice like a young yeah. quarterback when you have a guy who's supportive of that young guy in terms of okay you should let them know what you like like yeah. don't be afraid to let them know what you like somebody that can literally just kind of figuratively or literally put your his arm around your shoulder just be like hey man like this you can do this yep. like this this is a, you can communicate this if you want you can tell them what you don't like what you do like help them find their voice in that way that's kind of what they felt that's like it might be call. for justin herbert who is not that way personality wise where chase daniel is a little bit more you know, gregarious like has a little bit more of that to him yep. a lot of different effects you can have on that young guy who is often very moldable at that stage of his career so yes i get it all right i do too Enough, enough treatises on the importance of veteran backup quarterbacks. One more move for the Panthers. Also brought in Hayden Hurst. Like three, years, 20, three years, 21.75 million, 13 million guaranteed. Nice deal for Hayden Hurst. Turn that one year run with yeah. the Bengals into a nice little long term deal there. I know. Just get with a good quarterback and a f- passing game that really, really will pop up your numbers. I mean, uh, Uzama had a nice year too. going, <laughs> you got paid off of that as well. Um, it's yeah, the, no, I always talk about the Chris Kasurik career rehabilitation plan yeah. with defensive linemen. Yeah. We're going to have the Joe Burrow tight end career rehabilitation plan just on one year deal cycling through in Cincinnati. That's exactly what it is. Or yeah, it's like tight ends playing with Peyton Manning or offensive lineman too. But this makes sense. He's like kind of Mr. Above average at tight end. He does everything kind of well. He's not, you know, like he, every ball goes to him, you're for more than happy. They needed a guy like this. Um, as like, as far as their tight end wise, they're, 
uh, or uh, what's his face? Not Tommy Tremble, but the other tight end. I'm blanking on his name. I don't have the roster, but they, they, he's more of a blocking type. Tommy Tremble, they're still trying to guide along and figure out what his best role is. So this guy can play a lot of snaps for you and kind of does a lot in the auxiliary role. And he's going to be a, a young quarterback's best friend. Like just yeah. being underneath, he has sure hands. Kind of makes a lot. It makes a lot of sense. Like that, I like this pairing. One quick bit of news: just saw that the Ian Cowboys Thomas. restructured. Sorry, that was the other tight end. Sorry, Ian Thomas. That's the other tight end. I was trying to think. <laughs> They've got a few over there. The Cowboys restructured Demarcus Lawrence's deal, which opens up eight point nine million dollars in cap room. The Zeke release being June first, it's not going to give them a ton of immediate relief. So mm-hmm. I was wondering which other levers they were going to potentially pull if they were going to try to go get a receiver of some kind. So now them. having that $9 million more in cap space after restructuring Gallup earlier in the week, hopefully gives them a little bit more breathing room if they do want to make a somewhat yeah. splashier move because it does feel like they needed one more pass catching option as part of this overall off season plan. Yeah. And OBJ had his, his workout a few days ago that a lot of teams attended, but uh, yeah, that's what it seems like. They, all these moves, like the Zach Martin restructure is like, that's of course they're going to do that because they have to get under the cap anyways. But like all these kind of next moves, like you said, Demarcus Lawrence, Gallup. Okay. I was looking at it today after the Zeke news. Cause it's like, okay, well that's a post June 1st. So there, you know, there's only so much money you can use in the short term after you make that sort of move. So what can they do to actually free up usable space right now? And Demarcus Lawrence had a fairly big base salary. That was the one that made the most sense. I didn't mm-hmm. know if they wanted to keep pushing more money into future years with him. I guess actually, might be the first time they've done that Tim. on his new on his new deal. Because remember, he signed that huge extension, and then I think I believe he signed a new contract that essentially ripped up the old one. It mm-hmm. was a three year, forty million dollar deal. So yeah, so I believe this is the first time that they've restructured. That they, actually, that might be a lie. It's so hard to know. All these <laughs> uh, all these deals in uh, in Spot Tracker are hilarious because at every there's a base salary column, a sign yep. bonus column, and a restructure column. The Cowboys, like all of them, are all filled up all the time. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like it's hard. There's no, to, there's no hyphen, like a little like dash a, it's there. It's like a yeah. shell game with the restructures when you look at the Cowboys contracts. So yeah, either it's, way, yeah, this, they they made it work. <laughs> they, I just believe this is the second time they have borrowed from Demarcus Lawrence's yeah. contract. However, you want to put it, next year he has a twenty-one million dollar cap hit as a result of all of this moving around. He has a void year on the end of it, so they're borrowing from the bank of Demarcus Lawrence again to hopefully continue to add talent to this team this off season. One more NFC South note off of the Hayden Hurst thing: Falcons bringing back Caleb McGarry. Yeah, Ian Rapport says three years, thirty-four and a half million. I think it makes sense for both sides. It makes you great know, sense. Uh, a lot of those, you know, we, we mentioned this. There were more expensive, more attractive options at right tackle and free agency for some of the teams that needed them. If those guys were going to get paid, what sort of market was going to leave for Caleb McGarry? If it was a little bit cooler because of the other options, could the Falcons get him back at a reasonable price where they understand what he is, they understand what he does well, they understand what their offense can be with him in the mix, and it seems like that's the agreement and the idea that both sides landed on. Both sides win here. I love a deal like this. That it's a very fair deal for what he got. He improved to this level essentially. Um, yeah, didn't want to see him outside that Falcons offense because, like you said, they could mitigate his weaknesses, but they they know what they got, and he looks so comfortable with what they asked him to do, which matters so much. That was just the same discussion we had about the Cowboys defenders re-signing. Um, but funnily enough, the exact same contract that Rob Havenstein signed a few years ago with the Rams. And they're like the similar type of players that kind of mauling right tackle. It's a little limited as a pass protector kind of gets hidden a little bit as with all the play action and boot stuff. So Haven signs a bit better, but with cap inflation, it makes sense that they got the same. Like it was kind of, kind of seemed like a continuation of that contract. So uh, no, I, I really like this. I think this is perfectly fair. Kind of exactly what I would have paid him. Uh, I was scared that he might get 18 million and whatever new team that signed him goes, what the fuck is this? <laughs> We're passing 35 times. What the hell? This guy's giving up three sacks. But no, the, I think the Falcons are going to use him perfectly. I like this a lot. Few former Niners pass rushers on the move <laughs> over the it. last day or so. Charles Amenahu gets a two year up to $20 million deal with the Chiefs. I, oh. it, it it pains me hey, to see okay. him sign that sort of deal with the Chiefs oh. uh, when when the Bears need pass rushing help. Oh, okay. uh, that is, I, I think, a really reasonable. He's 25. I know he was so useful, such a good player for him last year. Great I, call by you. That was your that was your breakout candidate. That was a great tab by you. 
I just think he's a really talented player. You know, yep. you watched him in that playoff run after he got traded to San Francisco. He's got a lot of just the frame. And then the underlying pass rush metrics are very kind to him. And cool, what's Sean. nice with the situation he's going to walk into in Kansas City, I think that you could, if you're trying to see his production in the most pessimistic way possible, you could look at it and say, they got a lot of guys on that San Francisco defensive line. And yep. there's going to be really good opportunities for somebody like him. They've got some pieces along the Chiefs defensive line. Definitely. Now he gets to play with Chris Jones. George Karloftis is there. I think they could go draft another pass rusher. So I think that group overall has a chance to be really strong by the time this even starts. Maybe even better than they were a year ago. I'd say probably better than they were a year ago with yeah. Frank Clark as that other guy on the edge. Yeah, and Carl Loftus started to come along, especially in the second half of the year. And Chris Jones is Chris Jones. We know what he is, but I, I agree with you. They add one more player to that front four. He's young, so you still have, might have some upside to tap into. He's He can move across the defensive line. Now you got Chris Jones and him. They can both be on the interior on third down, which I think is like, holy shit, that's terrifying. Um, and they can still add another player. Like, that's not, this isn't it. Like you just said, like that, I agree. This was a, I think this was a fantastic signing for an ascending player that I think is going to really, really be, he's going to like earn this money uh, for them. Like, I, I think this is going to be, this is a perfect fit. I really like the signing. really like the player too. It's the first one that I saw this week where I was, my heart kind of just sank a little bit. I was like, oh man, that, that's one that would have just been so easy. Like I, I just easily could have fit that in. He's a player that you can fit into the mix. And I understand, you know, somebody in the chat the other day was arguing about how it's, you don't want to use these mid tier contracts on premium positions where you could take swings on those premium positions in the draft. And I understand that, mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to spend, you don't want all of your defensive linemen to be $7 million a year free agents. When you can try to draft a guy in the top 10 yeah. and you can allow him, you don't want to block off that guy's path to development. Yeah. Defensive lines rotation. Exactly. Like, like it's, you just want to drop these guys in as a grand overall plan. Yeah. Yeah. Hassan Reddick was a free agent for the Eagles last year. It went okay. They went, it went perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 it went okay. It's, and it's actually better. I think when a young guy doesn't have to play 50 snaps and they could just play 25 yeah. until they're ready to add on. That's what you just need dudes. I, uh, yeah. look what the, like you said, even continuing off of Reddick, what the Eagles did in general, just yeah. find all these mercenaries and different types and what's, Let's rotate these these guys in, and everyone's everyone's better for it. The Colts, speaking of San Francisco 49ers pass rushers, signed Samson Ebucam to a three-year, mm -hmm. $27 million deal with $11 million in the first year, according to Adam Schefter. I mean, they had a huge hole at that spot after using Lannick and Gakwe. I don't totally know what to make of the Colts offseason so far. They released Matt Ryan. Shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. They saved, I think, $18 million against the cap by doing that. Good job by Matt Ryan's agent negotiating $12 million extra of guarantees, by the way. Matt so he gets all, a nice Matt deserves little, all the good things. That happened, a nice little chunk of change. <laughs> Matt Ryan has made a shitload of money playing football. Yes. Uh, uh, a, a, an astronomical amount of money playing football. Good for Matt Ryan. He did it right. So the Colts now have Samson Abucam as the other on the other end with Quiddy Pay. Okay. Still have Forrest Buckner and Grover Stewart. I guess the defense is, is more in, intact than than I would have thought a couple of days ago mm -hmm. based on where it was a year ago. They really haven't lost anybody other than trading Stephon Gilmore. And I can get – I can understand one – yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Like that's, that is a – Stephon Gilmore feels like a remnant of a different version of who you wanted to be as the Colts. Where you yeah. thought, okay, if we can get better with a quarterback with Matt Ryan based on where we were with Carson Wentz, can we fight to be a playoff team? Like that probably isn't happening. So I understand that he's no longer part of your mm -hmm. timeline. I, I just don't really know what to expect from them. And I think part of that is just not understanding what they're going to do at quarterback or what they right. want to do at quarterback. It's just a hard team to figure out right now. I think you're still curious about the Lamar situation there, but the Zaire Franklin came along for them last year. Like he had, yeah, they really resigned great... EJ speed. Like, yeah, I mean, they, it's that like, they've managed it's... to find linebackers coming out of the woodwork for the last couple of years. <laughs> I know. Right. <laughs> they, um, they were so, so good against the run last year. And like you, you couldn't move the ball on them inside the box. They were so fantastic. And they just always felt like they were missing that one. Like Yannick County really didn't do it for him. Um, where they just needed another dude to rush the passer. Like DeForest Buckner is such a mauler type. He's not like really the gap. He's just he creates chaos, like with his long arms going every which way. And, and I mean, seriously, that's how he plays. It's so funny. 
it's like wax on wax off just like with the long sleeves too and you know quitty pay is has come along like he's i think he's still gonna be a fine player and so they just need another dude and this is kind of just feels like another dude i don't think it's a home run hit uh, but it's another guy that's useful and i know you use that term a lot i'm gonna look up synonyms for useful um <laughs> so uh, functional he's a functional, functional guy functional i'm gonna have that up now from now on someone says you no one uses useful more than you nate tice and i was like i know convenient utility helpful applicable serviceable 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 that's what i'm going with he's a serviceable pass rusher for you that's gonna gonna play some good snaps and then if you do pop in another guy in there you don't need them you again like that the whole discussion i have a young guy with another guy that can both eat snaps and rotate in there two years removed from his stand with the niners but arden key signs with the titans according to mike garofalo three years 21 million 13 million dollars guaranteed he was a nice piece for the Jags last year and what they asked him to do. And you mixed him in. I, I, we were talking about, I can't remember who we were referencing when we were talking about who the Titans might add to their pass rush this off season. And I was like, do they want another like more bendy movable piece to yeah. go along with some of those bigger bodies that they have on the interior? And I guess the answer is yes. Yeah. So now you're dropping Harold Landry and key along with those maulers that they have. I even with, the questions about their offense. I think their offense is just, just oh, we're going to so be really bad, bad this year. I mean, no matter who's playing quarterback, I, I, I just feel like it's going to be a rough go for them on offense this year with their offensive line and just the state of things. I think the defense still has a chance to be pretty interesting because really? along with Arden Key, they signed Aziz Al Shire to kind of drop into that David Long role, like that wreck shit fly around role at linebacker in the middle of their defense. And I still think they have a lot of interesting players on that side. They do. Uh, they really do. Uh, and uh, like you said, the mauler type, the just that's what the defense does. And in in this, this Titans defense, there's wreck shit. It's just a whole bunch of guys are wreck shit. And Arden key is perfect for that. And they Seems like Rand really likes to uh, sign players he's familiar with. <laughs> just, just a little bit, right? Just a little bit without, uh, you know, Aziz Alshair. I, I love that signing. I think that's a, I, I, that's a nice kind of somewhat by low candidate. Uh, someone that like uh, branching out to like a more featured role. If he can stay healthy, that's always the if, but I haven't seen the numbers on that. So I haven't either. See, but... um, I liked it. I, I really did. I, I mean, I, th I thought maybe another team would really sniff at him, but again, familiarity coming from the 49ers and then Arden key a couple of years ago, same thing. Um, I like it. And uh, it opens up a little more creativity on their third down pass rush rather than just have four guys pinning their ears back and pushing like they like to do. So maybe they can kind of shift some defensive fronts as well. That's what Arden key unlocks. He deserved to get paid, paid, uh, uh, pay just quitty pay just was in my head. Arden key deserved to get paid. I actually thought last year he would get a deal like this because of what he yeah. showed with the 49ers and how much. I, agree. I, I was shocked that, he, that his market wasn't that great last year. Good on the Jags for signing him, but that I'm, he deserved to get paid, but it's a, I, I like it. He matches their personality in Tennessee. One more Titans signing when we didn't get to over the last couple of days. Andre Dillard, formerly of the Eagles offensive tackle, signed a three-year, $29 million deal. I've seen no information anywhere, even in the last 48 hours, about the guaranteed money, mm -hmm. which I assume means that it is not favorable for Andre Dillard, the fact that we haven't seen anything about it. Yeah. I understand this as a swing if you're the Titans. Mm -hmm. You had no answers at tackle at None. all on your roster. This is a guy who's still 27 years old. He was a first round pick. Obviously, it did not go very well in Philadelphia. He was supplanted by Jordan Mailata's development on that side when he was supposed to take over for Jason Peters after Peters left. But if it's three years, 29 million, and it's not a lot guaranteed, it's just a, you're, you're just rolling the dice. That's like good. it's a 27 year old guy. Can we find a starter? with this sort of reasonable contract for a year, for a couple years. And if it doesn't work, you move on. That's right. So I think betting on a guy with his draft pedigree and he played better you know, over the, in recent years when he got time than he did early in his career, it, it's not super exciting. Like it's certainly not like a rock solid move by Tennessee, but I understand it as a bet. If you're the Titans. Yeah. Bet. And just also, need bodies <laughs> that, yeah, that's what i mean I you mean, look they, at that offensive they depth chart, it's like holy crap like what happened here like it's not a lot that you can even go oh we like this young guy this fourth round pick this is better than anything they could have to answer and i'm sure the market this is fine it's just that you know if you're not really peaking with jeff stoutland you know, kind of, kind of not really what a guy wow it good, didn't work for him very good point it's yeah very that's, good point. that's it um but 
this is what you have. Like, this is kind of, this is the situation you are. I don't think anybody is expecting the Titans offense to really set the world on fire. So I think that's what it is. It's just a warm body to plop in there at the offensive line where you just need five warm bodies. We talk about best five starters. They just need five warm bodies, period. Few, uh, one more. This is fun. Speaking of the Chris Kasurik career rehabilitation plan, Cleveland Farrell, one year deal with the Niners. Check. It's perfect. Do it. It's perfect. Do it. Do it. If I they, hey, they, every agent, this. every agent should just be like, call for an Hey, I got a pass rusher. Hey, come on, come on. One year, four year. One year, four million. Come on, come on. We'll we'll we'll, we'll uh, refurbish that uh, that uh, reputation you got. And it's funny because they've done it with multiple guys yeah. from the Raiders. Yeah. Because Arden Key was a, I think, a third round pick from the Raiders at one point, right? Yes, he was. So Arden, Arden Key was a yeah, third yeah. round third, pick from the Raiders. In the same draft as Farrell. And he outplayed him. Is that true? No, it was a year before. Was he it? was a third he was a third round pick in the 2018 draft. But uh Maurice Hurst was also uh, was on the, in that draft with Arden Key. Like they've multiple times they've gone across the bay to, to grab a pass rusher from the Raiders and see if they could kind of juice him up with Chris Kasurik over there. That's very funny. And I think the the uh the Raiders did it one time it was like, Yeah, you can do that. We're gonna take Solomon Thomas. Yeah, how do you like not, that? It did not happen the same way. <laughs> how do you like that? <laughs> yeah, it didn't work the same way. <laughs> One more quick bit here. The Buffalo Bills bring back Jordan Poyer, which, okay. yeah, I, I just, again, one of those things where I think he's worth more to them than he is to anybody else. They got a good thing going there with Micah Hyde being back. We get to see those guys play together again. Just one of my favorite safety pairings in the league. Yeah. I, I just... I'm happy that that's where he's going to end up and that's where he's probably going to finish his career because yeah. he's been fantastic there and you know, good for them figuring something out. Another one pretty interesting here, Deontay Hardy, the punt return kick returner and part-time receiver for the saints signs a two year up to 13 and a half million dollar deal with 5 million guaranteed with Buffalo assuming to return for them. But I think that also probably to play a little bit of offense, he's shown something as a receiver. Oh yeah, I'm a big fan of Hardy. So I, uh, I think this is fun. I love this. I thought this was awesome as far as fitting with the quarterback and what he likes to do. And this is, and I tweeted this. This is Deontay Hardy is what the Bills wanted Isaiah McKenzie to be. It's a that, gr- it's a great great point. That's him. And but Hardy's already done it. He's a returner, but also just yeah, guy. He's actually a really good route runner. Uh, he's got a lot of juice. It's just he's tiny, and so he gets hurt all the time. But they're not paying him like that. So it. Incredibly explosive and a damn good route runner. I, I really like this one. I think this is, I love this fit, plopping him in into that offense that can add that kind of vertical juice and bring some yak. And you're not, he's never going to have more than like five targets a game. You know, it's not like you're bringing him in like, oh, this guy's eating it. He's your number two with digs now. It's like, no, this is just a valuable role player that I, I think every offense that wants to be explosive needs a guy like this. Where do you think Deontay Hardy ranked in yards per route run? In 2021, when he was getting real run, it's super high up there, isn't it? It's like eighth or something like that. I will first of all, I will list the guys who were ahead of him. Okay, in 2021, all all top guys, yeah. Cooper Cup, Uh Debo Samuel, Devontae Adams, Antonio Brown, and AJ Brown. Yeah, that's it. And then he had something ridiculous like first downs per route run was pretty high up there too. It's like he's efficient and explosive. He's he's a good player he's a really good player <laughs> he only had 57 targets that year yeah. but he had 36 catches for 570 yards and he ranked sixth in the nfl in yards per route run in 2021 he was banged up for most of last season yeah so he didn't really play but it's like five seven one seventy that but that's what isaiah mckenzie is too. worthwhile bet it from is brandon being over there in buffalo for a team I like that this needs a, a little bit more juice on offense all right that's all we got so we got i'm trying to think of any, any other notes i got in here Oh, P. Ryan going to the Broncos. Like oh, that that's one. right. That's right. I like that one. I, that no, I just want to throw it down in there. my notes. I, I know that you're a big P. Ryan guy. I am. But I think he's one of, if not the best, pass protecting back right now in the in the league. Smart player. Sean Payton likes a smart player. So you're, he's not a, like he's not going to run for a thousand yards for him, but he's going to play some really, really good, valuable snaps for them. So I, I like that one. I, I, Sean Payton's definitely rebuilding this team in his image. <laughs> it's got a lot of smart guys on that team. I think that's all I got, though. That's all we got. Yeah. We we'll have a lot more tomorrow around the exact same time. Sorry, a little bit late today. Had some trouble with the setup over here in my hotel room. Wanted to 
look as pretty as I could for you guys. So it took a little bit longer than I had originally planned. But we'll be back tomorrow at our normal 3.30 p.m. Eastern time to recap day four of free agency. Hopefully we'll have some more fun stuff between now and then. A few big name guys still out there. Orlando Brown Mm -hmm. hasn't signed yet. You know, we still got a couple more dominoes to fall. Maybe some trades could happen over the next day or so. So a lot of things potentially on the horizon. Very excited about that. In the meantime, please rate and review the podcast wherever you happen to listen. If you want to go on Apple Podcasts and leave us five stars and tell us you like the show, I'd really appreciate that. It would mean a lot to us if you ended up doing that. Please subscribe to The Athletic. Theathletic.com slash football show is where you can keep up with all of our fantastic work, all of our writers' fantastic work recapping free agency we will be back tomorrow 3 30 p.m if you're listening to this on thursday we'll be back today at 3 30 p.m eastern until then appreciate you guys listening we'll talk to you soon